Let's see if we can now move on. Mr Geoffrey Donaldson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm delighted to uh, move this uh, motion in the name of my right honourable and honourable friends relating to the implementation of the Armed Forces Covenant across the United Kingdom, including in Northern Ireland. The DUP is proud of the contribution uh, made by the men and women uh, from throughout the United Kingdom, yeah, including yeah, Northern yeah. Ireland, who serve in our armed forces and who have served uh, the United Kingdom well over so many years and in many theatres of conflict across the globe. And we make particular reference, of course, to Northern Ireland. Operation Banner was the longest running military operation in the history of the British Army. In the course of that operation, uh, there was a very high price paid by the members of our armed forces, and we pay tribute to them today. 502 soldiers from the regular army, seven from the territorial army, five former regular soldiers, 196 members of the Ulster Defence Regiment, a regiment which I was proud to serve, 40 former members of that regiment, seven members of the Royal Irish Regiment, four from the Royal Air Force and two from the Royal Navy. We salute the memory of all of these brave souls. Today, there are many people in Northern Ireland who enjoy life because of the sacrifice of those who were prepared to put themselves in the front line in defending <coughs> the entire community against terrorism. Of course. The right honourable gentleman, and to carry on the right honourable gentleman's point, can I say that 20 per cent, apparently, of the forces that deploy in defence of the United Kingdom come from Northern Ireland, and yet you only have 3 per cent of the population. That's a pretty good record. Thank you. Well, I very much appreciate the, the uh, very kind remarks of the Honourable Member for Beckenham, and of course he himself uh, served with distinction in Northern Ireland yeah, and yeah. to this day carries the scars of his service and the memories of those who did not return home with him. And of course he is right that in terms of the reserve forces, and I'm delighted to see the Minister for the Reserve Forces in his place, a good friend to Northern Ireland. Um, we do supply uh, in the region of 20 per cent of those uh, soldiers deployed um, on operations, and we're very proud of the contribution that they make to the armed forces of the United Kingdom. And therefore, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is important that in respect of the implementation of the Armed Forces Covenant, that uh, those who come from Northern Ireland, who reside in Northern Ireland, have the same access to the support treatment and care that they require uh, when they retire from the armed forces, as applies across the United Kingdom. Uh, and it is the case that we have a significant number of veterans living in Northern <coughs> Ireland, many of whom served during the course of Operation Banner, um, but also um, others who have served in more recent conflicts. And, uh, therefore, uh, with the drawdown from Northern Ireland, and the end of Operation Banner, some of the facilities that were available for the care and treatment of the armed <coughs> forces in Northern Ireland are no longer in place, such as the Duke of Connaught unit at Musgrave Park Hospital, which was a specialist military facility, and of course it closed um, after Operation Banner. So this has created a greater reliance on the National Health Service and on the facilities that are um, accessible by everyone. Um, uh, across the public in Northern Ireland. Of course. Thank you for giving way uh, on just that issue. And would he outline perhaps to the House the difficulties which servicemen, uh, ex servicemen and women in Northern Ireland face because of our particular problems with Section 75 um, and the inability to give priority to ex servicemen, which can be given in other parts of the United Kingdom, but cannot be given uh, in uh, Northern Ireland. Well, I thank the Honourable Member for East Antrim for his intervention, and I will come to that in some detail. But it is worth noting that the Armed Forces Covenant is, of course, designed to ensure that veterans are not disadvantaged by virtue of their service in terms of accessing the care, the treatment and support 
that uh, they require. And I think at times there is a misunderstanding about what the Armed Forces Covenant actually means in terms of equality legislation and so on. And, and I think that is something that we do need to address. I would referred to um, the Troubles, as they are sometimes described in Northern Ireland, and a recent report by the World Health Organization on post-traumatic stress disorder identified that Northern Ireland has a higher incidence per head of population of PTSD and trauma-related illness than any other conflict-related country in the world. And that includes places like Israel, Lebanon, where there have been sustained uh, conflicts for over many years. Uh, the study found that almost 40 per cent of the population in Northern Ireland had been involved in some kind of troubles-related, conflict-related traumatic incident. Um, and, uh, the survey estimates that uh, violence has been a distinctive cause of mental health problems for about 18,000 people in Northern Ireland. When you consider that against the population, that is quite significant. Um, and, and, and yet, there is not specialist provision made for the fact that there is a higher proportion of people with trauma-related mental illness in Northern Ireland because of the conflict um, than, than uh, arises in other parts of the UK. And this is particularly the case for the ex-service community. Uh, and whilst the Police Service of Northern Ireland have a specialist facility uh, funded by government uh, which uh, seeks to treat uh, officers and former officers who served from trauma, um, there is not quite the same kind of facility uh, for those who served, many more actually, who served with the armed forces. In fairness, and I would want to mention uh, the Royal Irish Regiment Aftercare Service, uh, which is a unique uh, provision for Northern Ireland, and something which this party fought very hard to achieve uh, when the Home Service Battalions of the Royal Irish <coughs> were being uh, disbanded. We felt it was important that there was an aftercare service uh, put in place to provide welfare support to uh, those who had served constantly in Operation Banner on the ground without relief over a long number of years. That is a factor worth bearing in mind. We are not talking about soldiers who did six month tour of duty and then left for two or three years and came back. We are talking about men and women who were on the ground all the time, constantly uh, on duty, and, and even when they were off duty, because many of them right. lost their lives, were killed whilst they were off duty, they, they couldn't relax. So, you know, the level of stress that that must have brought upon those individual soldiers and their families is enormous. And there is a toll for that. There is a price for that. And we need to be cognizant of it. And therefore, the Armed Forces Covenant is important in Northern Ireland in ensuring that the level of support that is required to meet the level of the need is consistent. Of course. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am most grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman for allowing me to intervene on. I wonder if you would just kindly take the opportunity to put on the record his appreciation to his party colleague, the former Health Minister Edwin Putz, who did an excellent job in looking after veterans' health, right. uh, despite Section 75 yes. of the Northern Ireland Act. And would the Right Honourable Gentleman take the opportunity to make it absolutely clear that it is really the responsibility of the Ministry of Defence to fund any additional uh, support for post-traumatic stress for those who served the country and served the Queen um, nobly in uniform in Northern Ireland and elsewhere. Well, I thank the Honourable Member for North uh, Down for her intervention, and, and she is personally aware, I know from her work, of many cases where mm -hmm. people require the level of support that we are speaking of. And uh, she paid tribute to uh, my friend uh, and fellow constituency representative. Uh, the former Minister of Health, uh, Mr Edwin Putz, uh, and I will just speak in a moment about uh, some of the uh, provisions that Edwin put in place. But I want just first to make reference to the report of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee, and I am delighted the Chairman of the Committee is with us this afternoon. Uh, they undertook an inquiry on the implementation of the Armed Forces Covenant in Northern Ireland. And one of the conclusions they reached was, and I quote, uh, there are a number of cases where the armed forces community in Northern Ireland does not receive the same level of benefits in relation to health, housing and education as that community in Great Britain. Um, and, uh, I think it, it is worth noting this 
um, and, and that there are deficiencies that need to be addressed. Would the member give way? Of course. Um, I thank the right honourable member for giving way. One of the other conclusions which we reached um, would actually fly in the face of the intervention earlier from your colleague um, from East Antrim with respect to the issue of Section 75, where we actually concluded that we had been reassured that the equality framework did not create a greater barrier to implementation of the Covenant in Northern Ireland, but actually felt that the problem was that departments were often not aware that that was the case, and so the Equality Commission had actually undertaken to inform them better of that situation. Well, I thank the honourable member for East Belfast for that intervention and, and uh, as I alluded earlier often the perception does not match the reality and, and I take the point she has made and I will come to section 75 now. Um, the Minister for Health, Social Service and Public Safety as was uh, Mr Edwin Putz, um, uh, he and I were in correspondence because I had a number of cases uh, where there were veterans that required health care support. Um, and uh, the minister did point out uh, in a letter to me that there were certain constraints that he faced within his department in terms of uh, uh, trying to provide um, adequate support for the veterans community, although he had established an armed forces uh, liaison forum which was linked to the armed forces protocol. And, that, and there has been, as the honourable member for North Down pointed out, some valuable work done by the Department of Health under uh, DUP ministerial control in seeking to coordinate the health and social care response to the needs of service personnel and veterans in Northern Ireland. However, it is the case that on occasion um, officials, uh, when they are interpreting that policy and the protocol, uh, are allowing the equality provisions to get in the way of providing That's the correct. support that mm. is required. And I think uh, yes, the Equality Commission has a job to do in educating uh, our civil service uh, on what the Armed Forces Covenant actually means in terms of ensuring that, uh, that veterans are not disadvantaged by virtue of their service. We're not looking for special privilege, and that's the point. It is to ensure they are not disadvantaged. And there is some evidence that departments are acting in a way that disadvantages members of the armed forces. Consequently, yes. I, I, I thank the right honourable member for giving way again. He's been very generous. Would he also take the opportunity to acknowledge the work that my colleague uh, Stephen Farry has been doing with respect to access to third level education for those yes. leaving the armed services? Because that is also a very important part of people being able to access the employment market after they have left um, the armed forces and be able to participate fully in society. I'm very happy to acknowledge uh, that uh, work and, and to commend uh, Dr. Farry for what he has been doing um, in terms of ensuring that. Uh, the, uh, those leaving the armed forces do have access to higher um, um, level education. Um, and indeed, I would also wish to mention the Department for Social Development, um, who have also been undertaking work to ensure that the housing needs of veterans are met. But it's still, there are still problems there. And I had two soldiers in my uh, office last Friday who, who are just in the transition, transition phase and have encountered real problems in getting rehoused. Um, under the Northern Ireland Housing Selection System. And I think there is more work that needs to be done here uh, to ensure that those uh, soldiers leaving service are not disadvantaged by virtue of having to join a waiting list um, uh, 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 and be positioned in, uh, where otherwise, if they'd been living ord ordinarily in their community, and these two soldiers have been resident in Lisburn in Thiefville Barracks in my constituency for some time, so they've been living in the city, but they're almost treated when they join the housing selection list as, as if they're newcomers. So we need to look at those um, areas and, 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 and bring some clarity. And that brings me to section 75 and the point raised by the honourable member for East Antrim. Uh, when the Northern Ireland Miscellaneous Provisions Bill was making its passage through this House, we tabled uh, an amendment to the Bill. And the effect of that amendment would have been to add to the, the, the list of categories of groups that are protected by Section 75 veterans of our armed forces. Um, and I think this is important because it, it, if, it, if our amendment had been accepted, I think it would have cleared up once and for all this misunderstanding that there is about the status of veterans of the armed forces in relation to equality <coughs> uh, and, and when you look at the list of groups that are covered by Section 75, it covers everything from people of different religious belief, political opinion, racial group, age, marital status, sexual orientation, um, people with disability, and so on. Uh, and we would like to see 
the veterans of our armed forces specified as a distinct group under Section 75 yeah, yeah, yeah. of the Northern Ireland Act yeah, yeah. so that it is absolutely clear to every department that they, under that equality legislation, have an obligation to ensure, indeed a statutory duty, <coughs> to promote equality when carrying out their functions. All that means is that our armed forces and veterans are treated fairly and equally. <coughs> and that they are given a distinct status under the current <coughs> legislation. And we believe that would bring the clarity that is required to the current law. It would end any ambiguity that there might be in the minds of civil servants. And we urge the government once again to look at um, a, 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 what is a minor amendment to Section 75. It does not alter in any way the statutory duty that is placed upon departments <coughs> and authorities, but it just ensures that veterans in the armed forces are properly treated when it comes to meeting their needs. I mentioned, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Royal Irish Aftercare Service, and again we would urge the Government, um, in, in respect of the continuity that that service provides, um, that we want to see um, it properly resourced into the future, because the need is not diminishing. In fact, um, it, there is um, a, a lot of evidence that, that post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, is something that um, only becomes apparent perhaps several years after um, a, a member of the armed forces has left service. So to suggest that um, in respect of the former home service battalions of the Royal Irish Regiment that we cease the Royal Irish Aftercare Service, um, I think would be wrong. It would be a mistake. And we need to continue that service to ensure that the thousands of soldiers who serve continuously in Northern Ireland on operational deployment um, 365 days of the year, that they are properly looked after, not just now, but in the future. I, th I, thank, I thank the member for giving away, and the right hon. member for giving away. Would he agree with me that the issue that he's just alluded to in terms of post-traumatic stress uh, that there are many former serving members who come to constituency offices. I had one in my office two weeks ago who uh, is still suffering a trauma 23 years after a series of events that affected him. Why not even on duty while he was off duty? And that's some of the issues that have been dealt with here. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for East London Derry for that point, and he is absolutely right. Um, Lord Ashcroft was commissioned by the Prime Minister to undertake a review of the transition for uh, veterans leaving the armed uh, forces and entering um, uh, the community. Uh, he made two specific recommendations in his report in relation to Northern Ireland. The first recommendation significantly was the, the need to amend Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act to enable service leavers and veterans <coughs> to receive the recognition and provision that they deserve. Um, and again, we call Lord Ashcroft in aid of our argument that we do need this legislation to be amended. Mm -hmm. Secondly, he recommended that the government should appoint a security vetted armed forces champion in Northern Ireland to enable service leavers and veterans to claim entitlements without fear for their personal security. And this remains an issue for many veterans in Northern Ireland. There are parts of Northern Ireland where we have veterans living yep. um, uh, and uh, there is still a threat. They are still targeted by those elements in our society who do not support the peace process. And therefore, um, I hope that the government will reflect on these recommendations. It is disappointing that in the response from the Cabinet Office, the, the, the uh, response did not refer to either recommendation. And therefore, I would call upon the ministers today to reflect on this. Uh, not only in relation to Section 75, but also in respect of the appointment of an armed forces champion in Northern Ireland. And that armed forces champion could also perhaps serve on the Covenant uh, uh, Committee, which meets regularly, and which Northern Ireland is not represented on, because unfortunately there is one party at the executive table that will not agree to the appointment of a military Covenant representative. And therefore, if we had an armed forces champion in Northern Ireland, they could be the representative um, at the uh, reference uh, committee that meets uh, regularly to discuss the implementation of the military Covenant. Uh, moving on, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, would, of course. Before the right honourable gentleman does move on, I was interested in his uh, discussion of the potential role of the Armed Forces Champion, and I wonder whether I might tempt him to suggest that the Armed Forces Champion might also look at the issue of a potential military credit union for both uh, servicemen and their families in Northern Ireland, but also more generally in the rest of the United uh, Kingdom too. 
There has been some debate on that prospect in the House too, and it would be useful to hear the right honourable gentleman's view on that. Uh, well, um, I, th I thank the member for his intervention, and, and we would be very keen in Northern Ireland to see such a facility made available mm -hmm. to veterans um, uh, of the armed forces and their families. Uh, credit unions are very widely supported in Northern Ireland, and, and this would be something I think that would be of real benefit. So, yes, perhaps the armed forces champion might have a role in, in helping to take this With forward. I really thank you again, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I am exceedingly grateful to the Honourable Gen right Honourable Gentleman for allowing me to intervene on him again. Um, I do not wish to, to sow a seed of dissension, but the, honor the right Honourable Gentleman would understand that, um, from my perspective, I would be a little bit nervous about how the former members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary, indeed the Royal Ulster Constabulary Reserve, would feel if Section 75 were amended only to make reference to the armed forces and not also to the RUC and RUC reserve. And I'm sure the right honourable gentleman will understand where my heart lies in that part. Well, indeed, of course, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I understand entirely the point. And, and, and since it's not within the scope of this debate, I had not made specific reference to this. But indeed, when we tabled our amendment to the Northern Ireland Miscellaneous Provisions Bill, we sought to uh, include another category which would have involved all of the innocent victims and survivors of the conflict in Northern Ireland, and that would, of course, inclu have included the Royal Ulster Constabulary, yeah, the Reserve, yeah, yeah. the Police Service of Northern Ireland, and so on. And I uh, emphasise the use of the word innocent um, in terms of our definition of, of uh, a, a victim. Um, so I, I take the point that the, uh, the Honourable Lady has made. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, there are some very good facilities in Northern Ireland, and I want to commend at this stage the excellent work of the military charities in Northern Ireland, particularly the Royal British Legion, um, SAFA, uh, 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 Combat Stress have done some excellent work in helping those with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, the, military, the various regimental benevolent funds, often overlooked in, in this, but quietly undertaking work uh, with uh, former uh, members, and they really do a very good job and have worked throughout uh, the period of Operation Banner, quietly supporting uh, the armed forces and our veterans. But we sense that there is a need um, for a more coordinated <coughs> approach in terms of the implementation of the Covenant. Um, and that is why we met with the Prime Minister, myself, uh, the Right Honourable Member for North Belfast um, and others, uh, and uh, sought uh, a commitment from the Government to assist us. Uh, with the establishment of um, a, a, a dedicated centre in Northern Ireland uh, to meet the needs of veterans. This would bring together some of the military charities um, with the Veterans Agency as a kind of one-stop shop for veterans. Um, and there is support uh, within the community, the armed forces community in Northern Ireland for this. There is support among the charities, um, and we have made some progress. And we are looking for example, to help for heroes. Um, and, and the people of Northern Ireland, I might say, Madam Deputy Speaker, are very generous in their support of military yeah, charities. Yeah, yeah. Every year, without exception, the, uh, the, the, the poppy appeal. Uh, uh, Northern Ireland contributes more per capita to the poppy appeal than any other region of the UK. Yeah, and you can understand yeah, yeah. why that would be the case. Um, and we, we support generously other military charities, including Help for Heroes. And we've been in discussion with them, and they are, are I understand, in principle, willing to support the establishment of such a veteran centre in Northern Ireland. And we would ask the government to give the proposal a fair wind. And I'm very happy to meet with ministers at some stage to share with them the concept behind um, the veteran centre and how it might help to. Um, uh, ensure that there is proper and full implementation of the Covenant um, in Northern Ireland by helping to educate people as to the services that are already available. Well, we are not talking about necessarily as additional services, but bringing together those services that exist and signposting veterans uh, to, towards them. Finally, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to make reference to the Community Covenants. <clears throat> we do not have any Community Covenants in Northern Ireland right now, and I think that is a major deficit. And there seems to be somewhere in the system a reluctance uh, to uh, <coughs> see the implementation of community covenants. In my own uh, constituency, the city of Lisburn, uh, we have the headquarters of the Army in Northern Ireland, the headquarters of 3-8 Brigade, and we have two rifles now garrisoned in Lisburn. 
we would dearly love to have a community covenant that would um, encourage uh, uh, much more interaction, and it is there already uh, in Lisbon. Lisbon is very welcoming of the army, always has been, always will be, but we believe that the community covenants would, would help um, to um, uh, encourage um, a, a better relationship, an improved relationship between the armed forces garrisoned <coughs> in Northern Ireland and local communities. In comments to the Welsh Affairs Committee on uh, the 30th of October 2012, the Minister, uh, Mr Mark Francois, highlighted the particular challenge in Northern Ireland of implementing the Community Covenants. And he recognised in his evidence to the Welsh Affairs Committee that some local authorities in Northern Ireland, controlled by Sinn Féin um, and sometimes unfortunately aided by the SDLP, um, seem reluctant uh, to um, examine uh, the, the potential of the Community Covenant. And I think this is a, this is a deterrent. Um, uh, within the system. There is a kind of a sensitivity around this. And therefore, even councils like Lisburn City Council, um, which are more than willing to, uh, uh, to introduce a community covenant, uh, they, they keep hitting a brick wall. And I have encountered this. I have been encouraging for some time the council to, to uh, introduce a community covenant. And they tell me that when they try to do this, th there is a problem somewhere in the system, of course. But honourable gentlemen, will care to come to Plymouth to see how we actually put together a brilliantly good community covenant, and we're working incredibly hard on that. And maybe Plymouth? you'd like to bring people with you as well. Where is Plymouth? Well, I would be delighted to visit uh, Plymouth and to see the community covenant in action. Indeed, we might even bring some of the, uh, my colleagues from uh, Lisburn uh, to attend. But I would ask ministers, in, in, ex in examining this issue, uh, there seems to be a problem somewhere in the system, a reluctance to have community covenants in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, uh, there is, I understand, some kind of system in place with 3-8 Brigade at the moment uh, in respect of community covenants, so perhaps, um, and, and I'm happy to write to the ministers on this very point uh, to seek some clarity on where we are. But given that we have now 11 new uh, councils um, established in Northern Ireland, elected this year, taking on new and extended local government powers from April next year, this is a new opportunity, I think, for those councils to introduce community covenants. So let's not put any barrier in their way. And if there is, then let's examine why it's there and have it removed. Yeah, so, right, in, of man. course. Just, just on that point uh, about the community covenant grants, and perhaps the right honourable gentleman can assist me about the role that 3 8 Brigade plays in this, because I understand that there is, there could be an alternative way of doing this. And how satisfied is he that that would provide a full substitute for, for the way in which it operates elsewhere? Uh, and what are the inadequacies of that approach? Well, uh, my right honourable <laughs> friend uh, uh, puts his finger on, on the point here. That there seems to be a slightly different system in Northern Ireland for the establishment of community covenants than applies in other parts of the United Kingdom, which involves a role for 3 8 Brigade. And um, I, I have not yet been able to establish why, but there seems to be some reticence in the system somewhere about introducing community covenants. There are councils that are willing to do this, and therefore we should be encouraging it. And, and I'm happy to write to ministers, um, and, and perhaps we can get to the bottom of, of, of this. Um, so, in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Democratic Unionist Party supports the full implementation of the Armed Forces Covenant in Northern Ireland. There are some issues, some problems that need to be ironed out. We would like to see Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act amended to ensure that there is no ambiguity around how the Covenant should be implemented by government departments and agencies in Northern Ireland. We would like to see the continuation of the Royal Irish Regiment after care service, and we would like to see the establishment of a dedicated veterans centre in Northern Ireland. And finally, we would love to see the new councils in Northern Ireland each introduce a military, uh, a, a, a local community covenant to encourage um, improved relations between our armed forces and the community. And I believe that's what the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland actually want. Yeah.